Great. Well, just to oh, can everyone please mute themselves when they're not talking, and I will help out as well by muting everyone. Um, so thank you all for joining. I'm so excited for this panel. We have some great speakers who were in the rooms at Citizens Climate Assemblies and helped make them happen, and uh, have just a wealth of experience to share. Um, so we're I'm just so excited. Um, uh, like I said, we're recording this meeting, so if you don't want your face uh, shown in a recording, please turn off your video camera. Um, we'll ask everyone to mute, and then if you have any questions, please just uh, send them to me in the chat, and I will share them with our moderator, Rebecca Leber from Mother Jones, who is a reporter um, covering environment and climate politics uh, from Mother Jones's Washington, D.C. Bureau. Um, so just a few more notes on what the agenda looks like. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, I'll hand it over to Rebecca and our panelists to give quick introductions on their work. Um, and then uh, we will do a little bit of Q&A and then talk, uh, hear more from the co-hosts of this webinar about uh, what uh, Citizens Climate Assemblies could look like in the United States. Um, so the citizen, I'm a volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby DC. Um, we focus on uh, lobbying our elected representatives to uh, put a price on carbon and also, you know, around climate action generally. We have uh, over 400 chapters across the United States, been going since 2007. Um, and I got really excited about Citizens Climate Assemblies because CCL is really about um, helping people unlock their personal political power and uh, build relationships and educate and organize within the community. And this sounded like a great, uh, sort of a different form of, of what we're uh, working for, for um, a response to climate change. So um, welcome everyone. Um, great to see everyone. And uh, I think with that, I will hand it over to Rebecca. Am I unmuted? <laughs> Sorry. I think I need to be unmuted. Oh, no, we can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm a reporter with Mother Jones Magazine. I'm here from Washington, D.C. Um, it's really exciting to bring together a panel with people all over the world. I guess that is a small upside of the times we live in. Um, I've covered environment. Um, all kinds of sides of the issue for uh, eight years now and um, have written for a number of publications. Um, Mother Jones is home to Climate Desk Collaboration, so we work with outlets like The Guardian, Grist, um, Slate, and uh, many others on climate uh, stories. So um, I, yeah, I'm excited to learn um, a lot more today about this um, exciting direct democracy democratic tool called climate um, citizens assemblies and how they can be used to solve really intractable problems um, and uh, what is more intractable than climate change when we have um, such strong political divides especially in the US and I'm excited to learn more about how we can um, borrow more tactics from these assemblies uh, and what we've seen happen in other countries, how we can apply those lessons to the US. And we'll have time for some audience questions um, and a great uh, conversation with the speakers. So it's a really exciting lineup uh, with lots of experience in citizens assemblies. Um, we have uh, Professor Graham Smith today, who's the uh, director of the Center of Democracy uh, at the University of Westminster. Uh, his main research areas are in democratic theory and practice. He's um, been involved in an assortment of citizens' assemblies, um, including Citizens' Assembly on Brexit, and um, looked at these uh, how to use citizens' assemblies in a number of countries. Um, excited to hear more about that. Um, we also have Rebecca Willis here today, a researcher with 20 years of experience in environment and sustainability policy and practice. She uh, is a 
is a professor at Lancaster Environment Center and um, has worked on Citizens Assembly in uh, the UK. We also have Claire Mellier Wilson here, who uh, is a practitioner working in the field of systems change. She has um, designed and facilitated many engagement processes around environmental issues. And in 2019, with Involve, she facilitated citizens' assemblies on the climate crisis in Camden and Kingston. Um, she's also worked with a group on um, French climate. Um, sorry, she's worked with a group of accredited researchers on observing a French climate change convention. Um, and our final speaker here today is Lynn Davis, who manages the Citizens Initiative Review Program for Healthy Democracy, a US-based group uh, that coordinates innovative, deliberative democ democratic programs. Um, so we have a mix of speakers representing um, um, uh, different um, <laughs> all over the world and um, how citizens assemblies have been used in um, the UK, in France. Um, and we also are looking at how um, the US can learn from this. So um, really great to hear from all these levels of experience. So I think we're gonna transition into some presentations from the speakers um, and then we will open up for some questions. So um, I guess, um, so uh, Graham can uh, kick us off here. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna share my screen. This always is a interesting moment when you get to see my desktop, but there we go. Um, here we go. So I'm hoping everyone can see the slides. It's a real pleasure to have been invited to come and uh, speak at this uh, webinar. Um, it's a really exciting development from the Citizens Climate Lobby and I hope we can uh, help take forward some of, the, some of the work that's been happening around the world. So as, um, as Rebecca said, I've been working on Citizens Assemblies and other deliberative processes for about 20 years. And the last couple of years, everything's really, really kicked off for a number of reasons, which I'll explain. Um, there have been uh, three national level citizens assemblies uh, which have dealt with issues of climate crisis. The first one was actually the Irish Citizens Assembly, which a lot of people know about because it proposed a, a constitutional change to abortion, to liberalise abortion law in Ireland. But actually it spent two weekends looking at climate change as well. So it was the first uh, national level citizens assembly to, to look at the climate issue. And in the last few months, we've seen two climate, two citizens assemblies that have specifically looked at climate crisis as their, as their major topic. And that's the uh, citizen convention in um, France and the climate assembly in the UK. And we're really lucky today to have Rebecca, who was one of the main organizers, one of the organizers of the UK climate assembly and uh, Claire, who's uh, actually helped facilitate that assembly, but also was an observer at the French Assembly and give us much more detail about those. And just to say, there's also a movement of more local climate assemblies in the UK and in Poland and another, a number of other areas where this kind of larger scale model is being used at a, used at a local level. And what I hope today to talk about in my presentation is what we mean by uh, citizens assembly and also why they're valuable or why they're being seen as being valuable and, uh, and, and begin to open that question as to, as to how, how they might work in the States. So the first thing is, and I realize, realize that for some of you, I'm teaching you to suck eggs, you know what a citizens assembly is, but just in case there are people in the room who don't, there are really two characteristics that make citizens assemblies different from other forms of um, citizen participation. The first characteristic is the use of random selection or also known as sortition. And for the national assemblies, that usually brings together about a hundred uh, plus citizens. Um, this is the, the citizens are selected through either through what's called a civic lottery or through a process like random pho phone generators. Civic lottery is probably the, the, the process that is used most widely now. And that's the idea that you just randomly send out thousands of invitations to different postcodes, to different households. And then those people respond saying, yes, we would be interested in participating. They, they form a, a group from which you stratify a sample of citizens to make sure that you've got the, the equivalent number of 
women from um, the, the, the population, you stratify for ethnicity, age, geography, and, and any other characteristic that you think is, is critical. And I know that in the presentations, both um, Rebecca and Claire will talk about the, I think they'll talk about, I, I, um, the sampling that was used in France and used in the UK. The idea is that you bring together a body of citizens who are broadly representative of the wider public. And for, for my experience of working on participatory politics for the last 20, 25 years, is I think these are the most radically diverse bodies that you'll find in, in a democratic system. So this, it is very rare because usually these processes are dominated by you're already politically confident, the interest groups, etc. But here you're actually bringing together a sample of citizens that looks like the broader public. And, that, and that's really, I think, an unusual thing to try to do. Now, when you bring that group of people together, obviously they don't know each other, they've not engaged with each other, many of them have never been involved in politics before. So they go through a process of learning, of deliberation, and of decision making. And sometimes there's a bit of public consulta consultation that goes on before. So these citizens are exposed to different types of information, exposed to different types of witnesses. Some of them will be specialists in the particular area that they're talking about. Some will be advocates who will be advocating for particular solutions. And other people will, be, uh, will have expertise in the sense of their knowledge of their lived experiences. People who have been maybe who are particularly vulnerable to the issue under question. Of course, if you bring 100 people together, um, the, as I said, the, politically, the, the most confident will dominate, but that doesn't happen in a citizens' assembly because these are facilitated spaces. A lot of the work happens on small tables. You get plenary work as well, but you know you mix people around. People um, are, are, are facilitating in groups of varying sizes, and they go through a, a, a work program together. And the really critical thing is that is what they're working towards is a collective judgment on the task that they've been set. And as I say, the the, the UK and um, French assemblies had very similar tasks, but we'll talk about that uh, later. And the idea is that they come to set a, a set of recommendations on how we should act together. And they, they come with a public judgment. So the idea is to bring a diverse group of citizens together, to, to allow them to go through a process of deliberation and learning, and actually come to a public judgment. Um, from the work we've done, citizens assemblies and other deliberative um, processes have been proved to be particularly effective at dealing with issues that are characterized by uh, things like political deadlock, particularly where politicians seem to be unwilling or unable to act on a particular social issue. Areas where there's social division, where, where different social groups feel that we should move in a particular, in, in different ways. Where they're, where they're, they're highly complex and those, that complexity leads to trade-offs between different options and where there are long-term considerations. Because one thing we know about our electoral politics is we tend towards the short term, given the kind of short electoral cycles, whereas these spaces who are, which are not filled with ele elected members are actually able to take a much more long-term perspective. And I think it's pretty much anyone who's interested in the climate crisis will agree they look like the characteristics of the climate crisis. These are the problems we face of, of people not willing to act, different social groups pushing in different directions, a complex issue, and that, that need to look towards the long term. Now, when I introduced this, I said, look, you know, we've had these three assemblies which have dealt with climate change. And, um, you know, the first one was in 2017, the last two have been in 2019 and this year. But this is building actually on 50 years of practice. It's not as if these things have been dreamt up out of, out of nowhere. And um, some of you may know this already, others may not realize, but actually the practice started in the United States with the emergence of the, the model of citizens' juries, which is associated with the Jefferson Center, has been picked up by Lynn's organization at Healthy Democracy. But there's a whole bunch of processes like citizens' juries, like planning cells, like consensus conferences, deliberative opinion polls, which have been going on around the world, showing us that this kind of approach works. So the kind of thing that we're looking at today actually has this kind of an antecedent of uh, a, whole, a whole series of different organizations and, uh, uh, and events around the world, which lead us to these kinds of citizens assemblies we, we see today. And from that 50 years of work, so not just these assemblies, but from that 50 years of work, I think it's safe to say that we have evidence that given a clear mandate, given a clear task, given adequate time and resources, and given careful design, because these things need to be carefully designed, ordinary people are willing and able 
to make incredibly challenging and difficult decisions on issues as complex and as controversial as the climate crisis. I'm really happy to share with you more evidence that, that, that I can point you towards if you want to drop me an email at some time. But like you, I'm really interested to hear more about what's happening in France, what's happening in the UK, and from Lynn about what might happen in the United States. So thanks again for inviting me, and I look forward to uh, answering some questions and having a really interesting discussion. So um, next we have uh, Rebecca Willis to present. <laughs> um, okay, I think just getting set up here. Rebecca, can you see my screen or can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, great. Thank you very much. And um, it's great to follow Graham because he's he's absolutely the guru of these processes. And I'm 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 I've come uh, lately to them in comparison. So I just want to say a little bit why I came round to the idea that these processes were so crucial to uh, climate. And then I'll give you a little bit of my experience of Climate Assembly UK, the UK's national process. So for many years, I've worked with politicians and essentially trying to talk to them about their responsibilities around climate change. And I've researched how politicians think and act on climate. And um, one thing that, that, that really struck me from that is that politicians are, are, even if they understand the science and even if they want to act, they don't know what the next step is. And I think we can all pretty much comprehensively uh, agree that the democratic systems we have have not worked well for climate so far and so what happens as a result of that well you get a quite a strong uh, lobby saying as the uh, veteran climate scientist James Lovelock said it may be necessary to put democracy on hold for a while climate just can't handle this question so I want to ask you and we'll see if we can set up a poll or if not, I'll just take a show of hands. This is an absolutely honest, you know, just answer honestly what you think to this. Um, do you want to live in a democracy? So I'll just put it there for a moment. OK, so you're still voting, um, but it's a pretty comprehensive yes. We do have some no's. We have three percent no's at the moment. And, and I really want to talk to the no's because, you know, I genuinely think that's an interesting debate. But overwhelmingly, people do want to work, uh, people do want to live in a democracy. In which case, the question is, how do we make our democracy function better so that it can tackle the problem of climate change? And I mean, you know, for what it's worth, I'm in the 97%, not the 3%, although I, I do have sympathy with the 3%. I want to look at how you can make democracy, well, how you can have some, how you can have more democracy and better democracy and make democracy work better for climate change. And that is the very short version of uh, the, the, the book that I published right at the beginning of lockdown. Never publish a book as lockdown begins, um, but there's more there if, if, if you want it. So what are some of the problems with democracy that citizen can de deliberation can overcome? Well, I think that the, 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 the first one is this, um, it, sorry, I'm just gonna share the results of that poll. Okay, so the first problem that citizen deliberation can help address is this tendency, and I think this is pretty, the, the evidence on this is pretty clear that politicians underestimate levels of public support for climate. So broadly speaking, um, people, people's levels of concern for the environment are probably lower than activists think they are and higher than politicians think they are. That's the sort of rough line of it. Um, but, but it's pretty clear that politicians underestimate levels of public support for climate. Even if they're convinced that people uh, are worried about climate change, politicians don't really understand what sorts of strategies people might support. They might be worried about climate change, but that doesn't actually tell you much about what people want you, want you to do about it and, and, and what sorts of actions they would be prepared to support under what conditions. 
And the third problem, which isn't talked about so much, I don't think, is that, you know, in, in the UK and the US both, there is incredibly unequal access to the political process. We know that money speaks. Uh, we know that, um, you know, uh, that, that, that the power of voting is often not strong enough to overcome those vested interests. Um, and citizen deliberation can potentially um, really help to, to, um, to, to, to cope with that unequal access, to hear more of a sort of, more of an unadulterated view for citizens in theory. So these are some of the hopes I have, but it doesn't, it doesn't you know, it's not the magic wand. It, it won't necessarily solve things, but I think these are some of the sort of quietly radical ways in which democratic, in which deliberative processes can make a difference. So from my research with politicians, I had become convinced that uh, deliberation was not the only thing, but one of the things that needed to happen much more. And then the stars aligned and um, a group of us, including um, Graham and others, thought, right, we need a citizens assembly in the UK. And amazingly enough, at the very same time, this discussion was happening in Parliament. And so... Um, the uh, six select committees in Parliament, six sort of uh, committees made up of, of, of parliamentarians, all agreed um, that they would host a citizens assembly on climate. And I got the job of um, helping to design the process. And it was, you know, there was months of work. It was all like a frantic build up. And it led up to um, a uh, me walking into... Um, this room in Birmingham, in one of our major cities, and seeing my own country represented in front of me, 100 and, uh, 108 people, perfectly representative of my country as a whole. And, you know, even though I'd been building up to this for ages, that was an absolutely jaw-dropping moment. So this is what Climate Assembly UK was, 110 people, actually now 108, two dropouts. Um, and those are the criteria they were selected for, age, gender, ethnicity, educational level, location, and then attitude to climate change. The last one is important because when you send out invitations, people who are more concerned about climate change are more likely to reply and say, yes, please, I want to be part of this. And you have to make sure that your selection is balanced according to, um, according to uh, people's views on climate change. It was supposed to be four weekends. Um, the first one, what is climate change? What kind of general approach should we take? What are the ethics and morals around this? Weekends two and three, a lot of detail around uh, land use, food, farming, energy, all those individual issues. And then weekend four, pulling that all together. That was the theory. We did three weekends and then COVID hit. So that turned into that. <laughs> uh, we did the last weekend over three weekends online. And we actually, at the request of the uh, citizens and the organising team added in a session on the links between coronavirus and climate um, and we did the sort of bringing it all together as well as looking at greenhouse gas removal. So I can't, so the, the final results of the assembly will be launched in September but we did publish some interim findings around uh, COVID-19 because it's influencing decisions that happened at the moment. And the headline is, I don't have the time to go into in detail, but the headline, as you'll see with this slide, is there's overwhelming support for linking the economic recovery to um, achieving our carbon target of net zero. So it's about, uh, it's, it's sort of 80% support for that. Um, interestingly, um, part of that is that people were really up for this idea that you limit um, investment in high carbon industries, which com comes back to my point about the power of vested interests, because citizens completely saw the point about limiting investment to high carbon interest industry, something that politicians find very difficult because of those vested interests. Um, so, you know, I don't think oil or gas companies should be given bailouts. They're not compatible with net zero. Um, we also asked questions around lifestyles and again we had very high levels of support for um, steps to encourage lifestyle changes and a kind of bedding in of some of the things we taught, saw in terms of um, home working, changing how we travel and just generally taking that opportunity for change. So I haven't got time to go into all these reflections, but like Graham, I think that people do take their job very seriously and people think differently to specialists. And that is a really useful challenge for those of us who are specialists. It does depend a lot on how the findings are used. And I know that Claire will talk about that when she, when she compares with the French. 
Um, and the last thing I will say is that a key question for me now, and one that I'm grappling with, I don't really know the answer of, there's sort of two, there's two tracks you can go with these processes. In a way, I want to do like a whole kind of huge question about whether the political system we have and the economic system we have is, is capable of tackling a problem like climate change, that kind of whole system perspective. But I also want very detailed findings about what should our changes to transport and so on be that are usable for governments, that are usable for individual politicians in making individual decisions. So it's like, do you throw it all up in the air or do you concentrate on the detail? We tried to do both. I think we did, we, in, in the end, we did more detail than the whole thing, um, but that is an open question. Um, more to follow on the reports in September and I'll finish there, thank you. Great, now we have uh, Claire giving us a perspective on how this works in France. Hi everyone, um, I'll share my screen and um, sure. here we are. So can you all see my screen? Yeah. Um, so this is a picture taken um, on the 29th of June when the 150 citizens from the Convention went to um, hear back from Emmanuel Macron uh, to see what he made out of the recommendations that came out of the Convention. That was a pretty exciting day for everybody. Um, so I'll give you first an overview of um, the French uh, Convention. So it's, um, it started in October 2019. And um, it started, um, it was born in the context of the Gilets jaunes protest, which you might have heard about, which um, was a result of the rise of the carbon tax um, in France. And, uh, these, these led to um, quite a lot of unrest on the streets in France and as a result uh, there's a movement called Gilets Citoyens which was created uh, which brought together the Gilets Jaunes, Deliberative Democracy Experts and um, Green Activists together trying to see how we could address climate change uh, in France, and they suggested to Emmanuel Macron to um, initiate a, a citizens' assembly on climate, and they obviously had um, they, they they succeeded. Uh, it it was quite a long process um, to come to um, the, um, the, the the you know the convention itself. But the idea that Emmanuel Macron committed to was that he would not filter what comes out of the convention which was, um, I can come back to this afterwards. Uh, it's, um, the devil is in the detail with the no filter, but we'll get back to that. So the question was how to reduce greenhouse gas emission in France by at least 40%, and at least is quite important, in relation to 1990s level by 2030 in the spirit of social justice. And just to clarify this, that's the target, but actually um, France has the same, um, net zero commitment by 2050 as the UK. So this is a step towards net zero by 2050. It's just framed in a different way from the UK Assembly, which had a, 20, a net zero by 2050 uh, target question. And the aim was to come up with mesures structurantes, which we could translate as um, 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 measures really um, that would make a difference on the structural level uh, that will be enacted either through referendum, parliamentary vote, or directly turn into regulations. Um, the citizens, uh, they were 150 citizens, so slightly bigger than the UK Assembly, and selected by sortition. Uh, with um, a process for stratified sampling and um, uh, Rebecca Becky mentioned the, the criteria. There were six criteria in France, same as the UK, minus one, uh, which was the ethnicity uh, was not an option because it's illegal in France to discriminate against um, your um, colour and origin and ethnicity, basically. Um, the process, um, it was initially planned, um, six sessions were initially planned, and as a result of the uh, request from the citizens themselves, 
um, there was a, a, an extra seven, uh, an extra session I did, which meant that there were seven face-to-face -face sessions and two online weekends because of COVID. So there was a lot of additional actually time spent by the citizens um, uh, as uh, you know more than initially planned. Um, and the budget was five million euros, which is quite um, quite huge in comparison to the UK budget, which was five hundred and twenty thousand uh, pounds. The governance committee, um, that's basically the the um, structure which made the decision about how the process was designed and how the um, convention was run, and it included fifteen members uh, from um, different organisations. Um, and two citizens as well, rotating between each session. Um, the original features of the Convention, I would say, um, are, I mean, there, there are many, but um, it's, it was a highly political process right from the start, as I mentioned the origin of it, uh, and the way um, it was um, framed and um, the fact that, um, for instance, the chair of the co-chair of the convention um, is uh, Laurence Tubiana, who was the key Paris Agreement architect. So a climate uh, a climate um, specialist with very um, very strong, you know, position on 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 climate uh, change policies. Um, the other original feature was the what we call the logistic transcription. I don't know how it sounds in English, but um, what that meant is that the measures were um, translated into legal text with support from public law experts. So it was quite an interesting process, which meant that the citizens were supported um, to uh, become policy makers, really, and, and see what what the measures they were coming up with, what could they become, either um, legislative text or regulations or text that we could be put to referendum. And that was um, a really strong feature of the Convention. Um, the other feature was the consensus approach, which was very different from the UK Assembly. Um, Votes only happen at the very, very end, so at session seven on the 19th, uh, 20th and 21st of June, which meant that the, the, the citizens were really, um, how to say, um, they were really strongly encouraged or um, they felt they had to lead to consensual decisions. So what we saw at the end when the votes happened is that the, the votes were over, overwhelmingly supportive of the measures with support rates, voting rates of um, 80 to 99 percent, even actually 100 percent for one measure. Uh, and that has implications as well in terms of um, the process. Um, second, uh, uh, fourth aspect is the media um, coverage, and there was a, a really strong strategy of open access. So the media were given access to the um, deliberations and small group discussions and everything pretty much from the start. And the idea uh, behind this was to try to bring the conversation beyond the walls of the, the assembly. Um, myself, uh, I'm one of um, about 30, 30 researchers and we had um, we were given access to all the um, all the deliberations there were no table facilitations there were only two moderators per group of 30 citizens and um, it was a process process of collective intelligence so very much bottom up so the measures came up from the citizens themselves how am I doing with time I'm just conscious of I'll, if you let me know. Um, just an overview of um, measures and votes. So there were 149 measures, um, 460 pages, uh, final reports, and you can find the English translation of all the measures in the link I've put in there. And people voted by blocks of objectives rather than individual measures. There were five themes uh, that they um, looked at, consumption, travel, production and work, 
food and housing um, and also they looked at the revision of the French constitution and I can go into the detail about all of this uh, if you're interested. Uh, since the votes and that's what's quite fascinating in terms of um, how this has been received both by the population, the wider population and by politicians, elected members and, and NGOs. Um, the citizens decided to set up a, a small charity called Les 150, which is um, composed of the uh, citizens of the Convention. So there are about 130 members at the moment at um, 150. And the purpose of this charity is to ensure that the, the measures are followed through. So they want to monitor what happens next. Um, we had several polls since the Convention's votes have happened and it's been really interesting to see uh, what came out of the polls and uh, the French population, interestingly, uh, have been really supportive according to these polls of the measures and they are fully aware, the 7 out of 10 French citizens I think were aware of the Convention which is really high which shows how much the media um, has played a role in, in communicating about the Convention. Um, so as I said, 29th of June, uh, Emmanuel Macron um, told the citizens what he was going to do. And um, just to, to, in a you know, nutshell, he said he would only, um, he would support 146 measures out of 149 and he gave himself three jokers. Um, I can go back onto this, uh, but one of the biggest aspects that has been covered in uh, Anglo-Saxon media has been uh, the ecocide, and he said he would ensure the, the term ecocide is enshrined in international law so that leaders are accountable before um, the International Criminal Court, so it's quite a, uh, quite a strong you know, message commitment. Um, the finance bill since um, has happened since the 29th of June, and that was <clears throat> on the 9th of July. Interestingly, um, it rejected all amendments related to the Convention's measures. So for a lot of the NGOs in France, this was um, a, a kind of opportunity to test how the elected politicians were going to respond to, to the Convention's measures. And um, a lot of people are a bit worried, actually, um, about the, the response we've seen so far. And there will be a convention, uh, a con convention's bill, which will be discussed by Parliament in 2021. And Emmanuel Macron committed as well to hold a referendum in 2021. We don't know on what exactly yet. But. Um, here we are. Anyway, these are uh, a few thoughts on what next and what can we learn at this stage. And I think for me, there are aspects that haven't been brought up really in these assemblies so far. And I think um, I would be really interested to hear what people think, um, especially the, the, the adaptation side of, of climate change. Um, at the moment, we're focusing in these assemblies about mitigation. How can we look at adaptation? Um, you know, in a way, it's two sides of the same coin, but um, that's a question. Also, what do we mean by um, radical change? A lot of these assemblies are saying we need radical change, but actually, are we really um, talking about radical change or are we talking about incremental change? And so that's another thing that I think in terms of system thinking, as Rebecca was talking about, uh, it would be really interesting to explore that further. We've got what I call bottom-up process versus top-down. In what, in one way, you could say the UK Assembly is much more uh, about um, uh, extractive data, so trying to get a sense of where the public, is, a representative, representative sample of the population is at. Whereas in, in France, the process was much more top-down, where it was about collective intelligence and building collective intelligence from citizens themselves coming up with measures themselves. Um, then there's a deep versus wide engagement um, and then um, yes, uh, opinions versus values and beliefs versus governing sentiments. So what I mean by that is at the moment I think you know the political discourse is at the level of opinions and that's um, being polarized and then these assemblies are really good at going down the level of values and beliefs, but with climate change, 
I'm wondering if we need to go even a, a, a level be below that, which is what I would call governing sentiments, so more the emotions and the hopes and fears and deep, deep, um, yeah, deep, deep um, governing sentiments. And, and maybe these processes need to look at that as well. Uh, I'll leave it there. Sorry if I was a bit too long. <laughs> Great. Um, before we move on to Lynn, um, Claire, we had two quick clarifying questions from your presentation. Um, one was, um, if you could explain what no uh, table facilitation means. And the second question was, how it's possible people could choose remaining anonymous? Very good question. So um, there's an assumption that these processes, deliberative processes, citizens' assembly, uh, are facilitated in small groups. So in a group of 110, for instance, for the UK Assembly, there were tables of about seven up to eight people maximum. In France, um, there were five groups, according to the themes, of 30 people each, and they had two moderators in each group, which meant that the, the small group discussions were self-facilitated. Um, and these had, uh, this has implications you know, positive and negative, as far as I can tell, I've even observed the, the conversations and, um, but that's not um, what a normal practice or expectation would be of um, a citizens assembly. Um, so that's the first question. The second one was about the anonymity of citizens. Is that right? Right. Well, yeah. So, um, so in France, people were, um, the, 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 the default principle was anonymity. So citizens um, were only known with, from their, with their first name. Um, but when people wanted to communicate, for instance, in the media or on social media, they, you know, they decided for a lot of them to just um, not remain anonymous and give their um, last name and their, the, the, the town where they lived and but that was left down to each individual to choose. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and um, before we move on to Lynn, just a reminder to um, send any questions you have to Julia uh, Selker and we will uh, get those answered when we get to the Q&A. Um, so uh, Lynn, um, would love to hear uh, from your presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'm actually not going to do a PowerPoint, break the mold a little bit, just, just speak to you from old fashioned notes. Um, it's really exotic. Um, <laughs> for me too, I mostly do presentations. Um, so I first want to tell you who we are. So we're a, a small nonpartisan nonprofit based in Portland, Oregon called Healthy Democracy, one of the two organization, main organizations in the United States that have done citizen juries or citizen assemblies, the other being the Jefferson Center based in Minnesota. Um, and I see that Kyle from the Jefferson Center is also on this call, which is wonderful. Um, and they've been at it since the mid 70s. We've been at it for about 12 years or so. We started out doing um, something called the Citizens Initiative Review in Oregon, where a randomly selected sample of 24 everyday Oregonians would evaluate one of the ballot measures um, on the ballot that particular year. We have now expanded to doing um, other things. Um, we worked with the city, uh, a local government last year to um, help them decide uh, how much they should be compensated. Uh, there was division on the city council over this issue, and um, it's obviously a very sticky issue for everybody, which is, as Graham mentioned, one of the, one of the great things about these processes that they can handle issues that other kinds of democratic forms can't handle. Um, so they, they gave a recommendation and, the, and the, um, the city council actually passed it just outright, straight up, no, no amendments a few months ago. Um, we're currently working on a citizen assembly at the statewide level in Oregon on COVID recovery, which is a much different scale of, of issue. Obviously, it, these things can be used for very technical and specific issues, can be used for very broad issues. Um, so that one is going to be... Um, Right, what currently is, it's gone through two sessions, and I'll put the link in the chat afterwards, but it's healthydemocracy.org slash COVID. You can find more information about it or watch the, the live streams. Uh, we live stream uh, not uh, just, just sort of the main sessions of the event. Uh, so it's, it's working out kind of principles to make any decisions around COVID, um, and then also some specific 
policy recommendations around specific policy areas that the, the, the assembly has decided based on its, its um, self-defined agenda. So uh, these, these things, as has been mentioned already, are fantastic at, at dealing with um, complex and complicated issues when they have a clear mandate, when they're well designed, when there's legitimacy in the selection and in the sort of meta democracy of the, of the assembly. Um, they are really great at bringing new voices into politics um, that are normally missing, even from equity-based processes often, where people can still be tokenized and sort of, um, you know, the same individuals presenting or being part of a, a multitude of committees. These are very, very different. These bring out, even though there is an element of self-selection, getting an invitation in the mail is a really, really different thing than um, just there being a notice on a website to show up at a meeting. Um, and when people are actively invited and paid and given, you know, child and elder care and food and transportation, all the extra stuff that, that you get as one of these panelists, and there's a sense of gravitas and importance in what they're doing, then people show up and new people show up, importantly. Um, there is an often criticism of these, uh, often a criticism of these kind of events that they are random people. What can random people uh, deal with that experts haven't dealt with? Um, particularly on an issue that's very uh, technical and complicated and where there might be a great deal of misinformation. Um, that was the original purpose of the Citizens Initiative Review was to deal with sort of mass misinformation about ballot measures and, and the sort of money in politics around um, these direct democracy um, innovations from 120 years ago. But any evidence, and these things are always based on sort of cores of evidence, um, but any evidence needs to be interpreted. So the question is only who's doing that interpretation, not whether there is interpretation. There's always interpretation happening. And so we feel like it's, um, it's better, more legitimate, and more um, sort of transparent and democratic if um, at least some of that, uh, that interpretation is happening by a microcosm of the general public. Um, it should also be noted that there are, that these are equality-based processes in their purest form. That is, they just represent sort of a mirror image of, or a, a micro image of whatever the, the city or state or, or country is. Um, but there are, um, there's lots of discussion about sort of equity within the selection process and also equity within the, um, within the, um, the sort of activities of the assembly. I can talk more about that in questions if anybody has questions. Um, I wanted to talk for a little bit about, about situations where these things are, where these kinds of reforms um, I think are not appropriate. Um, and, and this will sort of lead into what differences there might be, in my opinion, between um, what's happened in Europe and the situation in the United States. One way that I think, one situation where I think a citizen assembly is not appropriate is where there are sort of wink wink assumptions in the mandate for the assembly. So when, they're, when, the, when that mandate is not created out of some kind of democratic process, be it a government or um, another assembly, as in the case of a, of a, a really interesting example now in Eastern Belgium, um, there, is a, there is an issue uh, with, with sort of legitimacy of where that question comes from that can spoil the assembly from the very beginning. So let me give you an example. We were approached um, recently by um, an official at the city of Portland um, to do an assembly perhaps on um, traffic, on congestion pricing. And uh, we said no. And we said no because um, this was, this mandate was clearly coming from one public official who wanted to push the issue on congestion pricing and was looking for essentially a push pole to, to sort of, uh, you know, battering, battering ram their point of view into the public sphere. That's not an appropriate use of a citizen assembly. I mean, um, actually, if I can be a little bit provocative, I, I, don't, um, I don't think the term climate assembly is a great term because I feel like it's, it's sort of like saying climate elections or something like that. This is not, and this is not a, a thing that is meant as as a sort of political um, political football, uh, you know, or, or uh, something that that uh, 
that that should be used in that way, in my opinion. Um, it should be used as a, as a genuinely democratic forum where the folks who are going into it are taking a risk into the genuine unknown um, of what this randomly selected panel will do. And uh, now that doesn't mean that it has to be completely open-ended from the beginning. In fact, that is rarely a good idea, but it does mean that the mandate and the organization of the assembly have to happen in a democratic manner. Um, in a way that is going to include folks who um, the organizers may disagree with. Because let's be honest, we, the organizers, are not representative of the general population. We know that. Um, we're certainly not. Um, I mean, look at me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we know that we can perhaps create the, the structures that might allow for that democrat, genuine democracy to happen. Um, but we need to not sort of uh, put something in at the beginning that is going to prevent that. Specifically, we talk a lot at the beginning of one of these assemblies, and I'm, I'm sure they did in France and the UK too, about sort of the ethos of the assembly and that we want this to be a very different kind of democratic form than what we currently have. Um, that we wanna be sitting at the same side of a table looking at the problem metaphorically, rather than sitting at opposite ends of the table, talking past each other or at each other the whole time with the problem sitting in between us. Um, and we can't do that if, if um, not everyone or almost everyone at the assembly sort of believes in the concept of the topic at least. So on an issue like COVID, yes, there's incredible division. There's incredible division just one millimeter below the surface. But at the surface, there's a recognition that, that, that this thing exists. And there's a, or not, not necessarily the virus, but the, but the idea of what's happening in society exists right now. The issue we have in the United States, in my opinion, related to climate, is that we don't have that situation. Uh, we have a situation where even in um, fairly left-wing states, 30% of the population doesn't believe this is even a thing. Um, so, so this is a very tricky issue as we see it um, to, to deal with just in a, in a sort of, you know, how, do, how does this even get approached? So I wanna, I wanna offer two uh, what I think are opportunities. One is that I think that this, among other issues, can benefit from a lateral approach. That we look at, at, at topic areas that will have buy-in and by buy-in, I mean buy-in to the process of even talking about them. So let's take the congestion pricing example. Congestion pricing, there's no buy-in. Most of the people showing up at the assembly will say, why the heck are we talking about this? Who, what politician or, or whoever, uh, you know, sort of deigned that we, that we do this? And there will, I think, rightfully have been a revolt. Um, but there could have been a lateral approach there, which we suggested, which was, look, Everybody in the city of Portland knows there are traffic issues and, and issues related to traffic. Um, and whether you believe, um, whether you believe, if I say that, Julia, I'll finish up here, that, um, you know, whatever you believe on that issue, um, there's a place for people to come at it, for people to say, oh, yeah, 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 that's, I, mean, I think I can convince people about something. And, 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 and then we can get into the, to the, beautiful meat of this democratic activity. Another um, opportunity, I think, is to look locally, where there are already mandates, where the first sort of two steps of, of the um, Extinction Rebellion uh, demands have already been met, which is there's a recognition of an emergency and a, and a mandate. And then it's, there's a reason why the Citizen Assembly comes number three, because you sort of need that mandate, as in the French and UK case, to say, okay, now we're gonna figure out how to do that mandate. Um, and in a city like Portland or Seattle where that exists, yeah, fair enough, we can do basically a European style assembly. And then there's of course a more systemic approach like Rebecca mentioned, which is the most exciting stuff to probably most of us, which is sort of a, a whole democratic system change kind of, uh, kind of approach. And I will stop there and wait for questions. Thank you, that was a great uh, way to take that home. Um, since, uh, when you decided to be provocative there, I think I'll throw you the first question. Um, you said uh, you had to take some issue with framing around climate change for assemblies. So 
Um, we're getting a lot of questions of what um, alternatives you would suggest. Um, and also maybe speak to just the word citizens if there's a, if, if that framing has um, some built in bias there. Oh my gosh, yes, thank you, uh, whoever asked that question. Yes, we use the word citizen in order to sort of reclaim that for its kind of original democratic lowercase c purpose. Uh, but these things, uh, sometimes they're maybe registered voters, um, but sometimes they're just residents in a particular area. Sometimes they're members of a school that's citizen as defined as a, as a sort of democratic decision maker. Um, and um, as far as climate change, yeah, we have tons, tons of ideas potentially, but they shouldn't come from us. Uh, we we um, never propose a, a topic for an assembly and, and don't believe that's right. Uh, it should come from some other democratic process. Um, and, but potentially, if we're just brainstorming, issues of transportation, there's a fantastic one everyone cares, some, cares about. And, and if you care about climate, there's lots in there for you. Issues of energy, same deal. Um, I mean, almost pick an issue. And here in Oregon, it's all about forestry sometimes and forest fires and that kind of thing. Everybody has a, 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 a stake there. Everybody can see themselves as, as having a, a seat at that table and, and wanting to, to come in guns blazing you know, with their argument. And then the magic of the citizen assembly is they, they see, oh my gosh, look at the diversity in this room and look at what happens when I talk to people that, that aren't like me and, and start to sort of experience their, uh, their lived experience. And, um, and that's when the sort of magic happens and we start to get to, to genuinely revolutionary solutions. I can talk more about that. Yeah, um, and opening this up, um, I would love to hear from the speakers how um, these assemblies um, can be used to address issues of climate justice and inequity, or or if there are limits to how it can be used um, to address racial injustices. We had a question from the audience um, on how um, you can both have a representative sample of the population while accounting for the fact that climate change has disproportionate impacts on certain populations um, and a representative sample might not fully capture that. So I um, would love to hear from um, the speakers of how you balance the tricky issues of racial injustices and um, bringing, um, making sure that the climate assemblies are not skating over those problems. Um, Rebecca, I see. <laughs> hand. Sorry, yeah, Graham wanted to come in as well, but um, I, it's really important to, so what is really incredible about these processes is that we are learning from people who are experts in their own lives. And it, it, I, I think that climate policy has generally been thought up by uh, experts who are, you know, generally metropolitan, well-educated, uh, often white, often, you know, more men than women, and, 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 and they don't have the necessary lived experience to understand, they don't always, I don't want to make assumptions, but, but, but they don't know, um, you know, how the policies that they're talking about are going to interact in people's lives. So let me give you an example, just not far from me, there's a proposal for a new coal mine. And it's in a very deprived, actually very white, uh, working class deprived community that used to be that used to have a lot of coal mines. And there's there's really strong local support for this mine, even though it completely goes against our climate policies. And uh, you know, I actually want, I would love to do a specific process in that community saying, you know, this area, you start from the assumption that this area really needs jobs, um, that, um, you know, it's really suffered from deindustrialization, And at the same time, we have these carbon targets. So there's a problem here, right? No one knows how to solve this. So can we work together in solving it? And I think that it's it, the difficulty for us as climate experts is that we have to cede a bit of power and we have to have a bit of humility that I do not know how to solve that problem, right? I don't want that coal mine to be there, but I understand why people want it to be there. And so I think solving, trying to solve those problems collectively 
has to be the way forward. And so I think that's when really local processes can 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 help hugely. As Lynn was saying, it goes, you know, it, it starts from the experience of uh, particular cities, particular states, maybe even particular communities, and starts with their own lived experience. Graham? Okay, I think this is a really challenging question. And I, I want to say two things, um, which I think, uh, um, which are how an ordinary assembly can deal with these issues. And I want to say something a bit more uh, contentious and, and, and problematic for assemblies. The first is that you can actually have social justice as part of the explicit mandate. I mean, actually, that was the case in France. They were given a mandate of, we want to have reductions by a certain percentage. And at the end, it said, in the spirit of social justice. And I know that in, um, and, I know, and Claire will tell us how much that was taken seriously, but I know also in the UK, they had a panel very early on about the ethics and, ethics and justice of, of, of the climate crisis. So, you know, there is a way of um, framing the topic to, to say that we want you to deal with these according to particular, you know, taking certain issues into account. So that's one way of talking about it. The second is that these are the most diverse bodies that we have seen. And so we are going to hear political judgments from a diverse body, which is very different from most of our governing institutions, which is a particular limited class of, of individuals. So these are immediately more diverse institutions than our typical institutions, which I think makes them more radical. But, and I, this is my but, I do think there is a problem for structural minorities and for especially Stru small structural minorities. I think that um, we do randomly select, but my, you know, particular minorities can be, will be selected, but there'll be small numbers. And one of the things we know from feminist uh, analysis is that you need a, is that actually you really need a critical mass of people in, in, a, in a body before a particular perspective is taken seriously. And so I do worry that certain minorities don't get the voice that we would want to see. Now you're caught in a quandary because actually your answer to that would be to oversample minorities. And there are certain assemblies that have done that. But when you're oversampling minorities, you lose to, to you know, the, one of the legitimacies of a citizens assembly in the eyes of the wider public is it looks like us. And that is an incredibly powerful image of an assembly that looks like us. If you start to radically oversample minorities, you're going to lose some of the people in the community who are going to say that doesn't look like us anymore. Now, I think this is a really challenging issue. And I, I, for one, am happy to see oversampling of minorities. I'm happy to see us think about those responding to structural injustices. But I don't think that some of our polities and some of our public are, are ready for that. So I think these aren't the most radical institutions you can imagine, but they are, the, they are incredibly diverse compared to where we are. And I do worry about, and I can't remember what the thing is, that you know, we're, over, we, we're looking for the perfect institution. I think these are a darn sight better than the other institutions we've got at the moment, but they won't always deal with the kind of some of the structural injustice issues. Shall I just build on Graham's points about social justice and how, how that was um, tackled in France? So that was clearly in the mandate, as Graham said, and um, it was it was very strong throughout the convention that came up in every single conversation the, the the social justice dimension and it's i think it's because the process was born out of a, a social um you know unrest and with the gilets jaunes so um but interestingly you could say there's um it was a, a particular fo focus because you could say we why not talk about inter intergenerational intergenerational justice for instance which i think uh, this is what is interesting with the UK Assembly is because that was left open in a way and then it was um, up to the citizens to say what principles they thought should underpin the, the net zero target by 2050. Um, but what um, I was wondering about, it's more question actually than a statement, but um, I was wondering in, if a way to bring more um, the uh, structural minority voices would be to look at how um, they can be actually a part of the lived experience um, sharing in the in the learning phase, and why don't we have more uh, perspectives brought by by people who are affected 
by climate change from various angles uh, in, in the learning phase. I, I feel at the moment that the current assemblies are very much expert focus and not enough lived experience right holders, you could say, in, in especially if you're thinking about global, the global um, uh, and global south. And uh, to give you a per per perfect example, in France, in the Convention, there's an tr uh, Amazonian tribe who came to visit and um, the, the CESE, which was the organizing uh, committee of the, the Convention. Unfortunately, they didn't come and meet the, the citizens from the Convention. It felt like a missed opportunity to actually have lived experience um, shared from, from, from them. That would have been so powerful. Um, yeah, so that's just an example. Can I jump in on that one too? If you don't yeah, you, you started with a really big question here. <laughs> yeah, so this is like as, as um, uh, yeah, folks have laid out, this is sort of a big question in, in our field at the moment. And from my perspective, there seem to be sort of two, two ways. As Graham mentioned, yeah, this is a heck of a lot better than anything that exists right now. Even many supposedly equity-based processes. Um, and, and, and not only on sort of the groups of people represented, but on, as I mentioned, the individuals represented, the sort of new voices out of the woodwork that folks had never heard from before. Um, so that that kind of diversity shouldn't shouldn't be forgotten. But there are two sort of main main ways. There's there's an sort of uh, equity inputs in the selection process. Graham mentioned some of the some of the difficulties about that. But for example, there's a there's a city here in Oregon that's going to do a process that will use the K-12 population. Um, it's a long-term planning process, and they said, hey, that that matches kind of the mandate, um, and also. Uh, they're going to be explicit about their desire for to for, to have a more uh, diverse population in an, on a number of different factors, and and that gets that. But it's sort of based; it's still based on numbers, but a different set of numbers. There's also inputs, which um, I think Claire mentioned to the process. For example, that that same project, um, I believe, will have some kind of youth-specific uh, process outside, you know, on the side of it that will kind of report into the assembly. So there's lots of opportunities for inputs into the assembly that may have completely uh, equity focused sort of lenses. Um, I think a lot of people are coming in with um, hoping to learn a lot more about um, citizens assemblies and perhaps how to, to get this moving um, more in the US. So um, we got a lot of questions about nuts and bolts of how this works um, that um, perhaps I'll throw to, to Graham to start with of um, who initiates a citizens assembly in the first place um, and how are the educators even chosen. Um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about um, how, uh, how then the power holders view these assemblies, how it informs the actions, and how to then um, keep the powerful accountable to what uh, the citizens are, are recommending. Okay, I, I've, I can't go into all of the detail of all of this, but you know, and I'm happy to, for people to contact me afterwards, and there are, there are things to point to. Initiation, um, typically these things are commissioned by, um, go, by public authorities, typically, not always, but typically, um, partly because of what uh, Lynn was saying earlier that they, that you know, the partly because you want actually the body who's initiating them to to respond to them, and also because they they need to be initiated by a, a body that is seen as legitimate by people. So there's a real problem, for example, for Extinction Rebellion saying it's going to run a, a climate assembly on its own because it will be seen as as biased. So there's this there is, um, but that's not to say that they can't be commissioned in other ways and. Um, Lynn mentioned in Belgium, they've introduced this really interesting experiment where they have a, a randomly selected council that decides in East Belgium what they're going to hold citizens' assemblies on. You could imagine using a, a citizens' initiative to decide what you're going to hold. It. I mean, there are different ways of doing it, but typically, empirically up to now, most of these have been commissioned by public authorities. In terms of experts, there are, there are different ways of doing it, but generally, you create a governance committee of people who hold different positions on the issue under, con under consideration. Um, and so you've got a, a body, a diverse body, a diverse governing body, who will then agree on the kind of information that is presented and the kind of, um, the kind of witnesses that are heard from. 
And I, I, when I did the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit, we had people who wanted to leave all the way to remain, and they had to agree on who was going to speak, who was going to speak from different sides. So there's usually some sort of oversight government, governance committee that is agreed on, which, 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 carry, which, which captures the different interests involved. And in terms of accountability, that is, the, that is, for me, one of the sort of the, the million dollar question with all of this is how do you get public authorities to act on what comes out the other side? Now, there's been some really interesting developments in Poland where the radical, where the, um, the uh, group that's been organizing citizens' assemblies in Poland actually has a contract with the, uh, with the mayor because they've been done, run at local level. And they, the mayors agree that they're going to implement anything that has 80% support or more within the assembly. And if they don't get, doesn't reach 80%, then they've got discretion. Now, that's probably the most radical accountability that I can see within this. But we're seeing things like Claire's, Claire mentioned that in France, the, the, the members have actually set up a charity which is going to oversee what the government does. But I think actually this is the weak part. And I think a lot of this, to, and I think the French example is really interesting because it's a highly political and highly public process. And now people are going to know whether or not the government is, is fulfilling its, its ambitions. I think one of the issues in the UK is still most people don't know about the climate assembly. And I think that creates more some problems for accountability. Although in the UK, it's interesting that the Climate Change Committee, which is a legally enshrined committee, is actually going to report on whether the government achieve. it looks as though it's going to report on, on how the government responds to the, the climate assembly. So that's the bit for me that needs more work, but there are really interesting developments. Sorry, that I went on a bit, but I tried to do it as quickly as I could. Yeah, it's a lot of information. Um, the maybe we can, um, if if also any of the other panels had had thoughts on that, particularly on the accountability question, that seems like the toughest issue here to crack. Um, uh, Rebecca, you have thoughts? Yeah, it it is the tough one. I mean, the you know the 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 worst outcome is that you know a lot of time and effort goes into these processes and uh, you know a lot of time of citizens and others is taken up and then they don't go anywhere and it is the i don't know if it's the same in your experience uh, other panelists and well any, anyone else who's seen these processes is it the number one question that participants ask how will the findings be used and but then you know at the end of the day i think in a representative democracy, which is the system we have, it's up to politicians to take decisions. And um, there are some as there are some people within Extinction Rebellion, for example, who want to replace representative democracy with direct democracy. They want the citizens' assemblies to actually make change laws. I wouldn't go that far because I think you're creating one problematic system with another very problematic system, which would probably be subject to the same sort of uh, issues around power and incumbency and uh, you know it would it would it would be it would be really really difficult to make decisions that way but I think we could ideally we would push things much more in that direction where there was a much clearer line of accountability between these processes and elected decision makers um, so France has gone further than that than the UK um, in the UK um, the six uh, parliamentary committees who've committed who've, who've commissioned the process i think they will take forward the recommendations but those committees themselves are essentially advisory they don't have legislative power so there is no clear route for a finding from our citizens assembly for a recommendation to be enacted in law and um, I, th I think that, that that's probably not as strong as I would like it to be, but I wouldn't go all the way and suggest that, that these processes should at the moment anyway replace, um, you know, essentially elected representatives. Um, just add something about this point, because I think that's where the referendum option is quite an interesting one. And that's what we've seen with the Irish Assembly, because in a way, by going straight back to the citizens, the wider population, you um, bypass the you know, politicians, you could say. And at the moment in France, that's the tension we're seeing. And interestingly, the citizens from the Convention um, got cold feet a little bit about putting 
um, you know, um, having their measures um, uh, out in a referendum um, because they felt they had been on the learning journey and not the wider population and they were worried that um, it wouldn't be received as as they were hoping. So uh, in the end, they decided to not have uh, the measures act for referendum. But that's that's what would be really interesting, I think, um, to look at in, in the future. So I, don't know what I, you think, I, think, I think after the Brexit referendum, there's a lot of nerves about going down this that path in the UK, but it might be different in other places. Yeah, the, the thing is, you know, the Brexit referendum didn't have um, a debate that was that l led to a good conversation in, in prior to the referendum. So I, I you're right. Think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think we have a quick um, comments from Extinction Rebellion, New York City. Um, and uh, Citizens Assembly US. So um, I guess we can kick it over to Extinction Rebellion here. And we'll get to some more questions after we've been getting a lot great of great uh, questions here. Great, thanks Rebecca. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Archie Kinane and I'm here representing um, Extinction Rebellion New York City. And I'll just briefly describe our organization and uh, our developing campaign for citizens assemblies and also a uh, broader structural change to New York City's government that um, centers deliberative democracy. Um, so Extinction Rebellion uh, globally is mainly known for kind of disruptive direct action to highlight the emergency of uh, the climate crisis. But um, calling for a citizens assembly is actually one of the organization's core and founding demands as well. And, um, I'm a member of and been working with the XR NYC citizen. And up until now, we've basically been researching, educating ourselves, educating the organization internally, and doing some public facing stuff. Um, but now we are kind of uh, getting ready to launch our campaign in, in earnest. And um, I just want to say that uh, to be totally honest, it looks, you know, different than it might have a few months ago for, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, the, the uh, countrywide uprisings after the murder of George Floyd and, and the government's responses to both have kind of made it clearer and clearer to more and more of us that these crises and injustices, they run really deep and they overlap and they're complicated and they aren't being dealt with by the way our political institutions work today. And there's, there's also been a growing and incredibly uh, deserved recognition of racial and environmental justice organizations that have been calling for community control and for real self-governance for, for much longer than Extinction Rebellion has, has even been around. Um, and so that's influenced our campaign. And then also kind of this, this education uh, process we've been going through has has as well and you know members of this panel have actually helped us out a lot so I want to say thank you to those and so um, with that in mind I'll, I'll kind of now describe wh what our campaign is so um, rather than, than organizing around the demand for a singular citizens assembly on the climate crisis um, kind of as, as Lynn uh, alluded to our campaign leads with a broad vision of collective survival through deliberative representative democracy. And we aim to build a coalition around this project of structural changes to New York City's democracies with other communities and, and groups, and then together to advocate politicians and organizations to sign on to this vision. And along the way, we want to initiate and, and support specific citizens assemblies or or other deliberative processes um, wherever we can, maybe a, a local citizens assembly or citizens jury in a city councilor's district or, or a deliberative process to advise the city's budget or land use planning to kind of make this vision real wherever we can and building towards a 2021 high profile citywide citizens assembly. Um, and uh, so if you want to learn more about or, or join this campaign, uh, please reach out. Um, 
And I also highly recommend reading the work of all of these panelists if you want to learn more. And, and finally, what we want to leave you with is just to ask everyone on this call to, at a very basic level, think about how government is just an organized way to make collective decisions and to really consider how you'd like that to work. And, and with tools like citizen assemblies and, and these other processes that the panelists have mentioned, how democracy doesn't have to be something separate from us. It can be something we do and something that we work together to create. And so I'll leave it there. And I just want to say again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you to Rebecca for, for moderating and to all the, all the great panelists. Great, and we have Citizens Assembly US here. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Johanna Lundahl. I'm an organizer with Climate Assembly US, or as we're known in Washington State, uh, Climate Assembly Washington, um, which is just a small uh, group of um, uh, informal group of citizens, constituents who have been advocating to our lawmakers to hold a citizens assembly on the issue of climate um, here in Washington State. And I can tell you a little bit more about that process as we have been uh, working and what we're still we're going to be doing in the future. I can share my screen really quick. Okay, one moment please. All right, I'm gonna try and be pretty quick, but I wanted to uh, just tell you that our mission is to extend, expand democratic methods in Washington state to address the issue of climate. Um, as a small, as a group of constituents, we asked our lawmakers to hold a, to hold a citizens assembly on the issue of climate. And first that had to, that involved educating them on how what a citizens assembly is and and then these lawmakers um, that were each chairs of different committees uh, in the Washington State Legislature um, had together co come together to co-author an op-ed which they published in a local newspaper on May 31st. Um, they wish to learn what citizens if they get together would um, would reach consensus about on the on the issue of some some type of climate mitigation. Um, now, exactly what that's going to look like, um, we don't quite know yet because we are still in a very formative stage of the planning process of a citizen assembly. But one uh, reason why we reached out to these specific lawmakers, amongst many others, but these folks are the ones who. Um, were excited about the process and uh, came together to co-author this op-ed. Um, these five lawmakers are uh, chairs of committees that are the uh, mirror committees to the same ones who called uh, the UK Citizens Assembly on the UK Climate Assembly um, in the fall of 2019. Now, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what's happening, uh, what these very specific stages are in the citizens assembly planning process but climate assembly washington is essentially an initiating team for the for this assembly and uh, we are in an initiating phase of the assembly um, where we are connecting outreach to stakeholders and we are educating a wide cross-section of folks who have a stake in the process or in, in some type of outcomes that would come out of a citizens assembly and who would want to provide input that would define the state, the scoping question of an assembly. Um, we also are, and then once, and then a big part of this process is to um, hand it over to someone uh, who is an organization that has a much greater, that has a great level of experience in conducting deliberative processes. Um, the coordinating team that would take over the logistical um, aspects of the assembly and do the things that would be needed to have a very um, a process that would be non-partial and be very um, 
uh, that would be seen by all parties as something that is um, extremely um, useful to our local democracy. Um, to go to the next slide, uh, as you can see, we don't have a lot of um, influence on the process after a coordinating team takes over, but there will be um, some oversight from groups involved in a monitoring team um, who would be made up of representatives from stakeholders across the state of Washington as well. What we are doing currently involve education and outreach to stakeholders um, to get them involved, get their influence in what exactly the scoping type of question should be for the assembly. We, um, as you heard from Claire, the scoping question of the French Citizens Assembly on climate was how to reach certain emission reductions target by a certain year in the spirit of social justice. Whereas in the UK, they had a scoping question that was uh, how to reach net zero by, um, by the year 2050. Um, wasn't as, um, wasn't quite as um, an exciting of a question as some activists had called for, uh, I think Extinction Rebellion, in their protests to do the various things that they had asked for. They, they asked for a uh, climate emergency to be to be named. They had asked for um, specific emissions reduction targets. They had asked for a net zero by the year 2025 instead of 2050. And they had also asked for a citizen's assembly to create that reality. Um, but in this case, the scoping workshop, uh, the scoping question will be what the stakeholders think that it should be. So we're getting, a, we'll have a large amount of input from stakeholders to create that scoping wish. Uh, scoping question. Um, the coordinator, the selection of coordinators is will be next, uh, is is the next large step in this process as well. Um, we are currently uh, seeking organizations that will take on the project and um, the determination of who those coordinators will be uh, will be ultimately made by uh, another democratic process um, a committee that will be made up of representatives of stakeholders as well as representatives from from government and lawmakers who had called for the assembly to happen. But ultimately, the biggest uh, point of what we're trying to do is also provide um, a kind of a model for what others who are excited about citizens assemblies and the benefit that that could bring to our democracies to get all these different parties in the same room, all, to get these citizens in the same room who are ordinary people who have no other motivation but to work together to create uh, policies and create recommendations on changes that they think would work and to have uh, those policies be taken very seriously by lawmakers and people in the highest offices of our of our government, local or maybe even nationally. So we uh, are trying to help others if they are interested um, to follow a simple a similar model to create citizen assemblies if that's what they want. Um, so our contact information is here if you're interested in connecting with us further or if you would like to advocate for a citizen's assembly in your state. The biggest thing that you can do is just contact your elected officials and share with them how this process could be beneficial to your democracy to instill better faith in democratic processes and bring much wider view, uh, cross section of people and ordinary citizens into the decision-making processes. Thank, Thank you. you Joanna. Um, I think that transitions really nicely for our final thoughts from the speakers on what um, lessons there might be for the U.S. and um, I think that answers the question of how you might um, get involved to to start your own or see this happen in your state or community. Um, but maybe we could get some uh, brief final thoughts from speakers on um, what uh, the U.S. can learn from successful climate or successful citizens assemblies to use for climate action. Um, yeah, perhaps um, we kick this off with Lynn. <laughs> so. Um... 
I've already said a couple of things, a couple of sort of ideas of ways that we feel like this could be this could be brought into the public sphere. I want to say I made a an uh, extinction rebellion example earlier, but we are very much not climate activists um, or associated with them in any way. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we are we are issue agnostic, which actually goes to my main point. But I think that uh, we need to think about these things first as not um, sort of methodologies for climate action, they're methodologies for decision making and can therefore be leave, used for any number of things um, and are also um, also require the sort of democracy before and democracy after that makes them legitimate. So where the mandate comes from is important, um, that in many cases it's bipartisan or that it comes from some kind of democratic, democratically accepted process is important. And what happens after it and where that, where that, uh, you know, where that goes, what kind of pressure follows up the assembly to ensure that it's not just a meaningless exercise um, is, is equally important. Um, what we have down, I think somebody mentioned, the thing that we have down most of all is sort of the assembly itself, but it's arguably everything around the assembly that sort of makes or breaks it. Um, so I think, um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, being, though, though this is not my issue, um, I think that climate is a really interesting issue and presents sort of really unique problems and, and that need creative solutions, I think. And there are great opportunities out there. I mean, I think the example, Rebecca's example of going super local is brilliant. Um, we shouldn't ever discount that local things can have a huge impact. Um, some of the most important examples that exist right now um, in, in our field are not the things happening at the national level or the state level. They're the things happening in, in a, this municipality in Eastern Belgium that has like 80,000 people in it. Um, so, uh, so you shouldn't be afraid of going local. I think I'll end it there. Um, Rebecca, could I put you on the spot for um, final thoughts? Yeah, sure. So I think, I mean, this has been such an interesting discussion. I've looked through the questions and I'm sorry we haven't got to them all, but um, I, I think that the, the main thing, I mean, Lynn has summed it up perfectly by saying we, we've nailed down the process and not everything around it. And what I really, really want to focus on is is how we make a better case for how these processes fit into and um, enhance the democratic process and you know sometimes politicians feel quite threatened by them because they say I'm the one who's elected I'm representing the public why do we need more representation and I, I think we really need to make absolutely clear that we are helping them to do their jobs better we are providing the kind of really fine-grained social intelligence which should help them to be better politicians and if they're really the, the people that we the people that are going to still even if we've convinced them in that about that the politicians who are going to still object are the ones who stand to gain or who represent or work closely with people who stand to gain from um, basically from climate delay and that is really political and really difficult um, and, and I think there's a danger that people see these processes as kind of quite nice and cosy and, you know, all a bit friendly, whereas actually they get to the root of some of the real difficult political issues around climate, like how do we stop taking fossil fuels out of the ground? And so my, my final plea would be, don't think of them as fluffy. They are like really serious. There's a really serious power play going on here, but let's do it in a way that we, let, let, let's talk about it in a way that means we enhance democratic processes rather than providing politicians with another threat. And um, yeah, um, Claire, um, any uh, thoughts? I, I, um, we've gotten a lot of very specific questions on um, how this has worked in various countries. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure speakers um, that have their contacts in their presentations would be happy to answer them. But um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get to them all. But any final thoughts, Claire? Um, well, let's be humble. I think that's where I'm starting from. Uh, we are all learning in this and <laughs> uh, 
I just mm -hmm. feel um, that we actually need to um, have more robust learning processes embedded in these assemblies um, and uh, especially around the impact and um, at the moment I feel that's the parent pauvre I would say a little bit um, they're, they're really focused on good processes and that's great uh, but I think we need to look at what impacts they're having and that's probably what I feel is missing out um, but yeah my, my, my key you know I don't have any groundbreaking and it's just let's be humble and learn and try to improve as we do it and uh, we're in this together. <laughs> Um, and I guess we'll close with where we started with Graham. Um, any? Well, I think what my co-panelists have said is all right. So I'm just going to leave with a short, short comment, which is really believe in the capacity and willingness of ordinary people to make really difficult political judgments. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Bree. Um, we went a little over time, but um, I know um, some of the speakers have included there contact information for the many great questions we didn't have time for, um, some really incisive points from the audience here. And um, it's been really great to learn more about this direct uh, democratic tool um, for fostering climate action. I've learned a lot here. So um, thank you, Citizens Climate Assembly and uh, Extinction Rebellion um, and Citizens Climate Lobby for uh, hosting us today. Thank you for moderating and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll follow up with everyone by email. So um, thank you so much and uh, we'll see you later. Bye. Best to all. Mm -hmm.